Let's get started. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining in. So today will be the curtain uh, raiser for um, the presentations that are going to come from the division uh, at the American College of Cardiology. And we are going to be the future leaders uh, and we're going to be seeing the future leaders as well. Um, so today we'll have uh, three presentations uh, for a change. Uh, we will have uh, the session open for Q&A. So there will be a 10 minutes uh, presentation followed by a five minutes uh, window for question and answers and we will moderate. And, and these question and answers, for these question and answers, please uh, hold up your hand in the chat box so that I can call you out and then you can uh, pose your question. After the session is completed, uh, hopefully we'll have some at a time. If there are some leftover questions, we can have them addressed. I do have a small presentation, so I'm going to just go ahead and show that. Uh, uh, let me just try to share. Uh, all right, so for today's uh, uh, presentation, again, uh, this is, uh, uh, we are doing it uh, as a part of the ACC rehearsal. Uh, it also showcases uh, what's being done in cardiology. But before going into the presentation, I would like to take a moment to uh, uh, remember Dr. Bijay Kandaria. Uh, many of you may know or may not know Dr. Kandaria was the 16th uh, past president of uh, American Society of Echocardiography. And he uh, played a very important role in the dissemination of echocardiography worldwide. Uh, so we are uh, mourning his loss. Uh, the world is mourning his loss. There are editors and uh, the American Society of Echo sent out a note uh, in his remembrance. Um, he died young. Uh, I was very fortunate uh, that he was uh, my mentor and uh, was transformational uh, for my role here in uh, cardiology. So I just wanted to take a minute to uh, pay gratitude to him and the, all the work that he has done. Uh, without him, uh, I would not be here uh, with all of you. So, uh, and I, I'm sure the whole uh, community, uh, echocardiography community feels uh, the same way uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, for um, uh, a reminder, uh, I just wanted to remind all of you the next uh, Monday Grand Rounds is going to be in person and it's going to be a combined first ever combined cardiology and cardiac surgery grand round. So please remember and remind everyone, it's open to everyone uh, who is interested in cardiology. And Dr. Dr. Michael Mack, uh, who's a renowned uh, surgeon uh, and uh, works at the NIH uh, and also uh, at the FDA uh, and, is, and has been responsible for the development of the course in uh, heart team concept in cardiology. He's going to come and talk about cardiovascular co-laboratory uh, and what does it mean for the future of cardiology and cardiac surgery. So it's an in-person, please make sure that you come here. And now for our stalwarts, uh, it's my uh, privilege to bring in our three fellow speakers. Uh, uh, Janet Kai, Megan Nehas, and Martin Takodi. In a short while, they will come in a spotlight mode. Uh, they will present in the same sequence uh, for their uh, important works that are being presented. But also importantly, we will be circulating a booklet very shortly. Uh, they're all close to about uh, two dozen different presentations are there at ACC to Please, please mark your calendars. Mark If you're at the ACC, make sure that you come and be part of it. Uh, and uh, uh, so we'll come now to uh, Janet. So it's my uh, privilege to bring in Janet into Spotlight. Uh, so Janet uh, is uh, pursuing her cardiology fellowship. And this is her second year. And she did her uh, medicine from... Uh, Drexel College of uh, Medicine in Philadelphia. And subsequently, he's, she's here with us. Uh, and uh, in a very short period of time, she has shown keen interest in different aspects of uh, cardiovascular research, particularly one of her recent work uh, uh, on uh, relationship on social demographic factors with primary cause of hospitalization was uh, published in American Journal of Cardiology. So she has had a good stay here with some of our research work and 
Uh, Janet is going to be uh, presenting her work from the ERIC data, uh, where she was uh, pursuing her research on how do you diagnose uh, atrial fibrillation. And I'm going to uh, have her come and make the presentation, and then we'll move on to the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Janet? All right. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Singupta, for the introduction. I'm just going to share my screen here and we can get started. Yes. Okay. All right. So good evening, everyone. I know many of us are looking forward to uh, attending ACC in a couple of weeks, um, and we appreciate this opportunity today to share a little bit about our projects with you. Um, our project looked at utilizing a machine learning model uh, for diastolic dysfunction, actually, to then predict development of atrial fibrillation. So left ventricular diastolic dysfunction has significant pathological effects on atrial structure and function, many of which are associated with the development of AFib. Studies have shown that nearly 30% of patients with diastolic dysfunction uh, also have AFib. Dr. Yanamala and Dr. Sengupta had previously worked on a machine learning model uh, that could predict left ventricular diastolic dysfunction using electrocardiographic and echocardiographic parameters and features. With the known connection between diastolic dysfunction and AFib, could this model then also be used to predict development of AFib? So we hypothesized that this machine learning algorithm, which estimates the severity of diastolic dysfunction, would also have prognostic value in predicting the development of future AFib. For our study, we utilized the ERIC, or Atherosclerotic Risk in Communities Database, which was started in 1987 for a long-term uh, cardiac health study investigating risk factors for heart disease and stroke. Uh, it initially enrolled 16,000 or so participants between the ages of 45 and 65 from four different communities here in the U.S. In 2021, about 6,000 of those participants were still active, now in their 80s to 90s. We analyzed a little over 5,000 participants from the ERIC database with no prior history of AFib who underwent clinical exam and echocardiography during their fifth visit and were subsequently followed for the development of AFib. Of those 5,000 patients, uh, about 588 actually developed AFib. Relevant demographics, comorbidities, uh, as well as certain biomarkers or lab work were identified for these patients as well. Uh, a pre-trained machine learning model was then used to sort patients into low and high probability classes for diastolic dysfunction. The algorithm produces a value based on the patient's data that represents the probability of developing diastolic dysfunction. We then classified uh, those with a value greater than 0.5 as high risk and those with a value less than 0.5 as low risk for diastolic dysfunction. We calculated event-free survival probabilities using the Kaplan-Meier method and adjusted for other predictors of AFib using Cox proportional hazard models. Uh, the summary statistics table compares some of the features between the low risk and high risk groups for diastolic dysfunction as categorized by our machine learning algorithm. So of those 588 patients who developed AFib, about 236 fell into the low risk category uh, and 352 fell into the high risk category. The difference um, in relevant cardiac biomarkers such as LDL, HDL, troponin, and NT-pro BMP were significant as expected. Uh, more patients in the high-risk group had conditions such as diabetes, heart failure, and coronary disease. In terms of significant factors, uh, we sorted the various factors that were significant in the model's ability to predict AFib into three categories, uh, demographics, which is listed in green, comorbidities in yellow, and lab work or biomarkers in red. Demographic features uh, that were significant included age, gender, race, body surface area, and diastolic blood pressure. Comorbidities and conditions that were significant included hypertension, heart failure, coronary disease, stroke, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, essentially, uh, finally, the lab work that was significant included LDL, HDL, GFR, uric acid, NT-pro BMP, and troponin. The C-statistic or concordance index 
is the probability that a randomly selected subject who developed AFib would have a higher predicted probability of having AFib than, say, an individual who did not develop AFib during that time. Uh, a value of one would mean that the model perfectly predicted which patients would develop AFib and which would not. So a C statistic of 0.7 generally indicates that it's a good model. Uh, we can see the C statistic for the machine learning model itself alone is 0.647, and that improves when incorporating various um, factors, uh, demographic factors, comorbidities, as well as the biomarkers listed. Um, both as in individual categories, but uh, the most improvement we saw was when we incorporated all of these factors. As a standalone factor, uh, NT Pro BMP and troponin had some of the highest C statistics. In terms of our results, as previously mentioned, uh, over 6.4 years, about 588 or 11% of patients developed AFib um, out of those original 5,000 patients that we included in the analysis. After incorporating demographics, comorbidities, and uh, relevant biomarkers, the model remained a strong predictor for AFib uh, with a hazard ratio of 1.73, 95% confidence interval uh, between 1.45 and 2, um, and with a significant p-value of less than 0.0001. The algorithm was also able to predict uh, nuanced AFib in the absence of pre-existing uh, cardiovascular diseases. These pre-existing diseases included a history of myocardial infarction, coronary disease, stroke, and heart failure. While NT-ProBMP itself was a significant predictor of AFib, the algorithm predicted AFib even in patients with normal NT-ProBMP levels, uh, which we de defined as less than 450, uh, as well as in patients who had both normal NT-ProBMP level and a normal left atrial volume index, uh, which we defined as less than 34. The figure A here shows that the Kaplan, the Kaplan Meyer curve for uh, AFib free survival after adjusting for demographics, comorbidities, and lab work. And all of these, the, the blue line essentially represents the group with low risk of diastolic dysfunction, while red represents uh, the high risk group. We found that there was a significant difference in AFib free survival, or from another angle, the probability that a subject would survive up until a certain time without developing AFib. So essentially, there was a difference in the rates of development of AFib between the low-risk and high-risk groups, even though this was originally uh, designed to predict diastolic dysfunction. Those in the low-risk group for diastolic dysfunction had a lower probability of developing AFib. Figures B and C focus more on the patients uh, without pre-existing cardiovascular disease. A figure B shows the KM curve for the subgroup without pre-existing disease and with normal anti-ProBMP. Uh, While well, figure C shows uh, those without pre-existing cardiovascular disease um, with a normal nt pro PMP and normal left atrial volume index. Um, so essentially, this showed that the, the machine learning model could uh, predict development of AFib even in those without prior cardiovascular disease with normal nt pro PMP and normal left atrial volume index. This figure shows the Kaplan-Meier curve for AFib-free survival, uh, taking into consideration the patient's NT-ProBMP levels, which had the highest C, to C statistic uh, of all the individual factors, as we mentioned before. We looked at the different combinations of low versus high probability of diastolic dysfunction and normal ProBMP versus elevated ProBMP levels. Patients in the low probability class for diastolic dysfunction and with normal NT-ProBMP had the lowest probability of developing AFib during the follow-up period, which was, I think, uh, as expected. And those in the high probability class for diastolic dysfunction and with elevated NT-ProBMP had the highest probability of developing AFib. Patients with normal NT-ProBMP levels in general had a lower probability of developing AFib than those who had an elevated NT-ProBMP level. And so in conclusion, a machine learning model uh, trained to grade the severity of diastolic dysfunction can also help identify subsets of patients who are at risk for developing AFib. Our model is able to predict nuance at AFib in patients after adjusting for demographics, comorbidities, and relevant biomarkers. Uh, even in the absence of pre-existing cardiovascular disease, 
This is an innovative approach to AFib management uh, as a model which can reliably identify patients at risk of developing AFib may allow for earlier treatment and risk modification, thus preventing downstream consequences. Uh, this is a list of our references, and a big thank you to Dr. Sengupta and Dr. Yanamala for their guidance with this project, as well as to Mark and Martin on their collaboration. Fantastic uh, uh, presentation. Um, so, so, Janet, so first let me um, be very candid about uh, this. So I think we uh, spent uh, some time uh, together working on this machine learning model and developing the Cox model uh, when you were making the abstract uh, and you were developing the abstract and the work that you did. Um, and I think I might, might have spent about, um, I don't know how many hours, but maybe I can count a few number of hours I spent. But uh, maybe Dr. Yanmala might have spent more hours. I don't know, but you did a spectacular job in bringing this to fruition. <laughs> so uh, I can tell you that I've I've mentored a lot of people, uh, but I think um, uh, the way you presented and none of the slides you have, you have ever shown to me, I've not discussed your presentation, but it was very perfectly done. Uh, I mean, there are certain areas we can talk about. But I'm really proud about how you went about and you executed uh, this work. So I wanted to first uh, showcase and highlight your effort into this and how you made it sound so perfect. Uh, and it's it's a good good piece of work, and I'm sure it will get published. But I'm I'm going to open. I think I can keep on probably uh, uh, keep on uh, uh, adoring the work that you're doing. But let me open up this for others to ask questions because I think. Um, this was a product that was conceived and executed in a very short period of time, I can tell you that. AJ, yes, please come on. Uh, yeah, I definitely echo great presentation and uh, you know, great insights. What I was keen to know um, is into the low risk and high risk the way this was categorized, what were the parameters of the diastology? I mean, that would have been, that the machine, this, this algorithm would have run. I mean, is there something, uh, because that would be the common thing would come to our mind, uh, that is there any confounding thing that we may have, uh, or the algorithm may have put it into, you know, sale to discriminate or something like that. So maybe I can repeat the question, Janet, to you. So uh, Dr. Shah is asking, what are the factors that go into the machine learning algorithm? What are the features or variables? Do you know, can you explain how does the variable go in and how does it work? And and I'm sure you can ask one of your colleagues here, uh, Martin, if you are, if you are uh, having any difficulties, but I'm sure you can try to answer that question. Yeah, and so we had a, a big spreadsheet, I think, that, that had a lot of different measurements, whether it was like the, the LVIDD, like the wall thicknesses, um, sort of the cavity size, et cetera. So I think that was kind of taken into consider consideration in, in kind of, um, you know, training the model and all of that. Um, so, um, uh, Janet, so thanks for, I think because what you received was the uh, risk. Uh, yeah, probably it was kind of the final product of the, yeah. the pre-trained so and sort I of gave you the I gave you the model. end point. So, uh, Martin, Martin actually uh, developed the um, uh, unsupervised machine learning uh, model that was published in Jack, and that was subsequently processed into a, 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 a classifier. So, Martin, do you want to tell them how, uh, what are the variables and how does it look? Uh, yeah, actually, yes. And I'm also going to talk about the same model in my presentation. I have some slides to uh, present regarding that. Uh, but briefly... oh, if you want to hold off, uh, I mean, we don't want to break any suspense or silence. So, I mean, if you want to hold off for your presentation, that's perfectly fine. Okay. So Martin will explain to you a more in depth. <laughs> I can probably come up, come out very easily, but I think let them, let him present because it is his model. 
Absolutely. Uh, no, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Any other questions? Any uh, any other clinical our electrophysiology group? Any any other questions from our um, atrial fibrillation group? So I want one question that Janet and uh, Navina is uh, raising hands. Navina, yes. So Janet, you know, uh, you did this study, and I want to understand because you know this is untraditional on un non traditional way of doing things. How, what was your reaction to this, and how do you think this would help a young budding clinician that is ready to go out and practice in in a couple of years or in one year? Would this kind of studies would augment? Right. And so this is actually, I think, my first time sort of venturing into the world of AI machine learning, um, you know, it wasn't something I'd considered in the past. And so I think it was very interesting to see, you know, what it could contribute to the future, um, because, you know, we we do have certain limitations when it comes to clinical diagnosis. By the time we find a patient in AFib who, you know, for some of them, we don't know how long they've been in it. Um, and so this kind of allows us a way to, you know, take existing data for someone, right? If you could get, get an EKG, get an echo on someone, um, then you can potentially predict even, like I said, in somebody who has, you know, normal lab values, normal sort of echo parameters potentially, still be able to predict uh, whether or not they will develop AFib in the future and kind of, you know, jump on treating that and managing that a little bit sooner. I, I have a question. Uh... For those that develop atrial fibrillation, what was the average time that the atrial fibrillation developed? Uh, I actually believe yeah, it was like three or so, about three versus 3.1 years between the low and high diastolic uh, dysfunction groups. Um, that was not like a significant difference. Um, but, you know, we essentially they were followed over a period of 6.4 years, but the average time was about three years when they developed AFib. <laughs> have, have you seen any? Uh, any other variables to have an influence on the timing of development. For example, if you have such variable, you might develop instead of in three years, in one year. Have you seen anything on that? I don't think we've actually specifically looked at that, though that is definitely something we can consider sort of moving forward. But you did have your C uh, statistics you presented. So there were several variables. Uh, majority of them had a discrimination, if you would say, in modest range, right? 0. 0.55 to mm -hmm. 0. 0.6, most of the clinical. Right. In fact, uh, that, was, uh, that was interesting. And um, what you also presented, if I understand correctly, was that even in people who are completely normal uh, left atrial, size or were not in heart failure or were not symptomatic and and uh, and I think the BNP measurements were also normal it was it had an ability to predict the development of AFib I think there was a uh, uh, clear uh, separation in the uh, groups um, what will be interesting uh, Janet is I don't know if mm -hmm. these people have any uh, follow-up data on future risk of stroke or um, any related uh, uh, conditions, including heart failure, which develops, um, how that separates out in the two group. And, and, and so maybe in subsets of people who develop AFib, what are the further downstream uh, effects, uh, whether stroke develops or not, could be right. useful. Yeah, and it was interesting because I know we had uh, originally also wanted to look at different age groups, um, sort of, you know, but then we realized that the entire, uh, you know, basically all 588 patients who developed a fib fell between the ages of 67 and 90 because they were between the ages of 45 and 65 back in 1987. And so as they were followed, you know, that's kind of the population that, that you know, we're, we're kind of analyzing here as well. That, that was really a wonderful presentation. I was wondering, I'm sorry, I came in a few slides late, so you may mm -hmm. have did any of the patients have in the diastolic dysfunction group have heart failure preserved ejection fraction? So I, I'm not sure the data that I think uh, we were supplied with had basically only said, um, like, basically just lumped everything into heart failure, history of heart failure. Um, so I'm not sure that it's specifically separated into sort of low EF versus high EF, preserved EF, that sort of thing. But it can be looked into. Wow. Yeah. Because uh, the echo data is available, so you can look in. Mm -hmm. You know, because they've been called vicious twins, AFib and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So you might expect that. Uh, right. 
we have a lot of common features in terms of inflammation in, in both. Yeah. Janet Great. Anthony, you, Janet no. Anthony Altabelli, very nice presentation. I just want to bring this back to the clinical realm. One of our challenges, many index cases of atrial fibrillation are stroke. 25% of strokes and octogenarians without a clear source is due to atrial fibrillation. Do you see in the future in medicine, people with high CHADS VAS scores and the ability to predict stroke and the use of prophylactic anticoagulation? Yeah, and I, I think that's definitely a, an interesting take. Um, you know, it's tough because the, as you mentioned, the octogenarians, I mean, this particular age group, they're at highest risk for bleeding, as well as the highest risk of, of having some of these arrhythmias. And so I think that decision becomes tough, but I, I think you'll at least be able to sort of point out the individuals who are going to be at highest highest risk and then have sort of an individualized conversation with them, right? Like, are the risk benefits, you know, worth it for them in that sense? All right. So I think, uh, thank you very much, uh, Janet. So I think we'll have more questions if time permits later on. So now it's my uh, privilege to bring in uh, Dr. Megan Nahas. Uh, Dr. Nahas uh, did her medical school and education at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. And then she went on to Brown University for her internal medicine residency, came back to us. She's been our chief champion, chief fellow, uh, championing uh, uh, with us, and and she has been uh, profound in her support for research, uh, and is now going to present a take on the use of echocardiography. So, Megan, take it on. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zagupta, for those kind words. Let's share my screen here. Um, also, I want to echo Janet. You did a wonderful job. That was a great presentation. I hope I can follow that okay. Um, taking a little bit of a different turn from AI, uh, I'm going to be talking about the clinical implications of stat cardiovascular fellows performed um, overnight at our institution here. No disclosures. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? I'm briefly going to just introduce what recommendations are for echo training in the fellowship and how we get echoes here at Robert Wood, and then review um, the, the echoes that were performed at, a, at Rutgers for the, uh, during one year. Then I'm also going to discuss some future areas for research when looking at stat echocardiograms. So what are the current training requirements for fellows? Um, it's something called COCATS-4. It came out in 2015, 2016, and they recommend different levels of correlating with amounts of months to get minimum training to go through cardiovascular fellowship. For echocardiography, and spe uh, specifically, it's three months are required. You need to both read transthoracics, perform TEEs, and you also need to perform transthoracic echoes. At this point in time, the recommendation is to perform at least 75 echoes. And so the, how do fellows get this type of training? Here, it's both going around with the stenographers during the day on your echo rotation, but it also is uh, also part of it is doing echoes overnight uh, when the lab is closed. So how are stat echoes obtained at Robert Wood? During the daytime hours, which are considered 6 to 5.30 p.m., an echo tech is available, and once the order comes in, they're able to go to the room. They do the uh, exam. If a fellow is available, they'll prelimit. If not, the attending will read it with a, within about an hour. After the lab is closed, i.e. between the hours of 5.30 p.m. to 6 a.m., if a stat echo is required, the primary team has to place an order, call the on-call fellow to notify them that an order has been placed, and then the fellow has to go do the uh, go do the echo and talk with the attending cardiologist who will read the study sort of in the live time frame and review it with the fellow, who will then pass the information along. So this brings up the question about what are some common indications for stat echoes? There's actually no set definition of what is required for one or what needs to be done. But in general, here or at Robert Wood, we do have some recommendations for what kind of uh, defines a stat echo. Um, it's one that requires an, uh, a patient has an urgent medical condition that requires echocardiographic information to make a critical diagnosis. These include sudden hemodynamic compromise of unclear etiology. This is your ICU patient with sudden cardiovascular or cardiorespiratory compromise where, or acute hypotension where the shock etiology is unclear. If you suspect pericardial tamponade, an aortic dissection, 
a post-procedure complication, whether from CT surgery or a cath or EP procedure. If a patient has ST segment elevations, but lower uncertain likelihood of a STEMI. Uh, if they're being evaluated for heart function if they're a transplant candidate, uh, if they're a donor candidate, or if there's concern for a uh, recipient of rejection. So these are some of the ones that can um, encourage somebody to call for a stat but whether during the day or overnight um, and get a study done. With all of that being said, why this study? There's actually very little data about the number or type of patients in whom echoes are performed overnight. As a current fellow, one thing that seems to pop up quite often is overnight, we seem like we're getting a lot of calls. Um, and it's something that's coming up and saying, hey, is this actually making a difference? There's really only been one or two studies that look into uh, these types of uh, studies overnight. And one of them looked at fellow performed first uh, echoes uh, over a course of a few years and just tried to identify the most common indication for the echo, as well as the concordance looking, did the fellow read overnight correlate with the attending read the following morning? Because at that institution, it was not required for the fellow to discuss with the attending overnight. Um, while here at Robert Wood, it is sort of a requirement that you do so. With that, there's very little data about the impact of these echoes. Are active changes in management being done, or is this something that if it was done 12 hours later, would have uh, had the same outcome? So are these echoes making a difference? Um, and it's from this thought that we developed a study to try to investigate if these stat act, uh, echoes are really making a difference. So here's just to review a little bit the methods of what we did. Uh, this is a retrospective chart review of one year of echoes performed after hours, i.e. between the hours of 5.30 to 6 a.m. at a single academic center uh, during uh, one year. These charts were analyzed to evaluate if there was an active change in management overnight, i.e. there was something done at the time of diagnosis. So it wasn't just that the study was positive, that we found an effusion or that we found um, a mass, but that something uh, was um, uh, done and changed immediately in the course of the plan. And then from these echoes, we also analyzed basic demographic and encounter valuables. And we did all this in SPSS and we obtained IRB approval. So now it's time to talk about some of the basic results that we did. So we reviewed all the echoes performed between January and December in 2021. Overall, this actually ended up being about 100 echoes. During the first six months of the year, 69 of the calls came in. And in the second half of the year, 31 came in. This averaged out to about two per week, but you can see there's kind of a discrepancy in the first half of the year and the second half of the year. Uh, we don't have an exact reason why this changed or whether this was just natural variability, but some thoughts are that in the uh, second half of the year is when we switch over and that's when more of the senior fellows are on call overnight. And so perhaps they felt more comfortable discussing the appropriate indications for a stat echo, or they were more comfortable doing a bedside ultrasound and saying, yes, I think I need to do a formal and get the attending involved or no, I don't. And a third thing that came into play during that time frame was that's actually when the fellows got a POCUS themselves. Um, and so that could again have changed over the number of official echoes that were done. Then uh, here, they were also found that there were four main indications for getting an echo. So despite the uh, eight reasons that are given, th these really fall into four main reasons with pericardial fusion being the overwhelming favorite with more than one third of calls coming in for that. Chest pain or concern for ACS was second. Shock and hypotension was third. And then a distant force was impeller positioning and then other kind of uh, came in with just some uh, random reasons. Here are just some echoes of some uh, examples of some echoes that were performed by fellows overnight. On the left, you can see a patient uh, who has a large pericardial fusion. Um, and this patient went to the OR with um, CT surgery within about an hour and a half of the echo being performed. On the right, you can see a, uh, a patient who came in with chest pain and BT storm. Uh, patient was shocked and bedside echo uh, showed a large RV um, and the patient was diagnosed with ARBC at that point in time. Well, with further investigation as well. So now we can talk a little bit about the basic demographics of the patients who are getting these stat echoes. Uh, they are overwhelmingly male, about 69%, more than two thirds. The average age is 63, with more than 80% um, being over the age of 50. The most common location that these echoes are being performed is in the ICU, and the most common requesting service is medicine. 
Echoes typically come in earlier in the evening between the hours of 5.30 and 10. And uh, more than two thirds actually get a repeat echo within two days, which helps to see the idea of was the echo beneficial, changing things or it didn't make a difference. So kind of to summarize this, it's not uh, kind of unexpected. Men over the age of 50 in an intensive care unit are more likely to get a request for an echo earlier in the evening. There's two final things though that I want to uh, point out that I found the most interesting. And that's the percent who had a change in clinical management and the percent who had in hospital mortality. So of these 100 echoes, 23% had an acute change in management at that point in time, meaning something happened differently overnight based off of the fellow performed echo. Regardless though of the active change in management, 20% of patients, if you get a stat echo overnight, will not survive that hospitalization. Kind of makes sense if you think about it, these patients are sicker overall, um, but still found that kind of striking that um, I don't think our stat echoes are causing people to die. I think it's a, just a, a confounder there, but it's something that, that we'll delve into a little bit more deeply in the next few slides. So first we're gonna look into the patients who had an active change in management and based off of the indication. So you can see, here that, uh, as we mentioned, 23% of patients, nearly one in four overnight, um, had something different. Of the indications, the most common reason for a change in management was pericardial fusion, where about 28% of the time, the call will make a difference. It's pretty good, but if you look down to impella positioning, which even though it only made up six uh, of the calls, two-thirds of the time, it resulted in something being done, i.e. the patient probably was in VT, you're putting the echo on, someone's coming in and adjusting the impella, and you're making a difference. There was a statistically significant difference between all of these. And you can kind of see here on the bar chart to the right where the, um, uh, which uh, indications are having the change in uh, management. All right. And next we'll look at, uh, see if the location or ordering service affected the likelihood of a stat echo changing management in the patient. You can see based off of the location, most of the changes uh, happened on the floor um, versus ICU, but there was a difference between them as well. And now we come into the individual services, which uh, unsurprisingly, cardiovascular services, such as the CCU, the cardiology consult team, CBI, CU, or CT surgery, put in the most requests. More than 50% of stat echo requests come from our division or our general department. Uh, but if you look at which group actually has the highest rate of change, it's actually in the ER. In the ER, if a stat echo is being requested, more than 50% of the time, the stat echo will actually change a person's management, i.e. where they're getting dispoed, uh, if you're calling it a, an interventionist or a CT surgeon or somebody else to come fix something. Where you see that there's not as much change is actually both in your MICU and then on your surgical services, um, where only one echo made a difference in the MICU and one in, in the surgical service line. And so now we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, the high mortality rate here and kind of what, um, what, what could have contributed to this. So first, kind of looking at the, the characteristics between the two, whether they were male or female, you can see that there was no statistically significant difference about who died. Majority of the deaths were in males, um, and they also made up more of the population who studied. In terms of the location, this was significant, as a third of the patients who passed away were in the ICU. And so that's when I kind of thought it was important to look at the indication for why was the stat echo being called. And so if you look at the indication for why it's called and whether or not there was a mortality, the highest mortality is in patients who are calling for shock or hypotension. And these were typically called by people, uh, by the medicine MICU service because it's kind of that undifferentiated shock. And so, and if you recall the shock patients, only two of them changed management. So a lot of these patients are having, um, an echo done, but it's not making a difference. Where you can see where they're not having as high mortality is in some of the other indications where it's the effusion um, and then in acute coronary syndrome or ACS, uh, just kidding. So when you look at this mortality by service, you can, uh, it also kind of showcases that the highest mortality is in the MICU, where again, only one echo made a difference, but they're still having the highest level of mortality. So the, the question is, is this high rate being driven by patients um, who are gonna pass away regardless uh, and that the echo might not have made an actual difference? 
So. And then finally, looking at the mortality versus the change in management, you can see that in the patients who had no change in management, there was a 77% mortality rate, while the change in management, well, if you had a change in management, uh, your survival rate was 87%, excuse me. And that was not statistically different. So it's not a hard stretch to kind of think that, hey, if a patient got called for acute tamponade and you took them, that their mortality decreased, but it's, it's a little hard to combine that. But was this um, difference in mortality uh, affected by either of these points? So to summarize kind of the results of what we just talked about, 25% of patients getting an echo overnight will have an active change in management, showing that these echoes are making a difference. The cardiology and CT surgery uh, service lines account for more than 50% of their requests. With This is likely because these are the people that are doing procedures that have the most likely caught a possible complication of having an effusion or, or a complication or are dealing with things around the heart. It's also more likely easier to obtain because when you hear uh, when it's a patient that's on these service lines, we're the ones doing it, it's much easier to obtain. And then while pericardial fusion is the most common indication and has the most uh, active change in management, only one third of consults created a change. This is as compared to impella positioning, much less frequent, but more likely to make a difference. So, and also when looking at what services make a difference, ER calls more than 50% of the time, MICU calls 7% of the time. Um, so kind of helps us as you're thinking about it. And then there's the 20% mortality overall with more than 50% of patients in the MICU passing away. Excuse me, and there's no difference between whether or not uh, there was an in-hospital mortality if an echo was obtained. So with all of this being said, I, this raised a lot more questions for me um, after going through that and kind of seeing some of this. And we thought about, can some of this data help the overnight team help triage what truly constitutes a stat echo? Are certain services just requesting a stat echo when, the, when everything is going on, whether or not they, it's gonna make a difference? And then sometimes in community sites or other places that don't have a fellow overnight is requesting an echo or having an echo. Can this help kind of guide when should echo text be needed or is something else available? Could the high mortality rates truly just be driven by a sicker population? And could, the, in, in, could this be impacted by saying in these types of patients, the echoes can be performed at a different time? How does all of this also get impacted by the growing use of POCUS, not only in our fellowship, but in other subspecialties as well? Is the reason why the ER has a higher rate is they're using it and identifying something on their own than requesting for additional backup? Or is it that the fellow is going around and making those decisions without talking to, uh, without talking to one of the attendings because they're feeling more comfortable, especially in their later years? And so does an attending cardiologist reading the echo make a difference? We weren't able to study concordance between attending and fellow reads here because the stat echoes overnight or um, there's no prelim put in by the fellow as we're discussing it sort of live with the attending. But in the other study where it showed uh, uh, the one that I talked about earlier, it was 20% of the time there was a difference. Does that make a difference? Um, and so what role does that kind of play? Um, so with that being said, thank you for your time. Um, any questions? Thank you, Megan. Uh, again, a very uh, important study. So I think uh, from the point of view of uh, utilization of ECHO, uh, in the uh, hospital uh, during off hour times uh, it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, and I was just trying to understand uh, with the introduction of the POCUS and now that fellows have POCUS, do you find that um, more useful or what do you think is, is going to be the future? Because in the sense like, yes, they request for a formal echo and if you were able to screen it out with a focus and then decide if a, a formal echo would be worth doing it, or do you think you can, you should be still directly jumping to a full echo, uh, a limited echo in the nighttime? Uh, absolutely. So when we got the focus, my uh, the first time I was on nights with the focus, the number of set echoes I did actually did decrease because. Um, I was able to help, I think, guide uh, some of the decisions a little bit more and also find different uh, pathologies that I wouldn't have gotten in general. So I, I do think that it was decreasing the number of set echoes that were performed. But it also gave confidence where sometimes if a team would call and say, hey, I really, I, I'm in the ICU. I have no idea what's going on. Those types of calls, which a lot of the time as seen by this data, didn't actually result in a change. 
I was able to go by and put a focus on and say, hey, you know what? I think I, I do think I see tamponade. I do think I see uh, one case was a surgery team. They called and I put on the focus and I was like, yeah, the RV is blown. I think they have a, a PE. Let me get the stat echo. And so we'll we'll get that formal read in so that way that can push. The team wasn't able to get it to push the team to um, to get the, the that overnight and the patient did end up going actually to get um, a TPA. So I do, I do think that that's making a difference because um, it can help triage a little bit, especially once you get more comfortable with it. And then you also get more practice with it. So you're developing those skills. So it, I, I think it is a, a benefit, but it makes it harder to interpret the data because we're not really recording our focus that goes anywhere. Great, uh, Megan. And one more question that I wanted to ask you is, so uh, now when you do the full, the limited study on the, on the full card, um, uh, you do it and then you call your attending and you're kind of doing it in the asynchronous, asynchronous fashion, right? Uh, versus uh, was if there was a technology that while you're doing and the attending is also there, able to do and converse with you. And believe it or not, we have some technology. We are going through some, through some IT security issues. Once it is cleared, then you might be able to actually do and transmit at the same time. It's called as a collaboration live. I don't know if you've heard about that technology. Uh, all the Philips have that, but we, we were not cleared off because of some security issue. Hopefully it will be cleared off. So the collaboration live actually mirrors the entire uh, Philips screen on an iPhone as you're doing the echoes. And in fact, uh, uh, you, are, you are able to go and manipulate the buttons also. Um, so so it's, it's, there's a lot of activities that are possible in the near future. We're just waiting for some clearance and, and Dr. Yen Mala probably will have, or Dr. Grace Wurstosa will have some more updates later on. Uh, but it will be interesting to see what all those things could do, mean for you all. And my very one, my second stat echo in the middle of the night, I was having a difficult time um, finding the windows and I actually did have to use uh, an attending on video. The patient had pe hemopericardium actually went to the OR also that evening. So it, it made a difference, but that was using a cell phone to help get some guidance. Great. Uh, I think we're going to go to our third. Thank you very much, Megan. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, we're going to go to our third presenter uh, and it's going to be Dr. Martin Takodi. So Dr. Martin Takodi is a, a postdoctoral research fellow in the Division of Cardiology. He's an assistant lecturer at uh, Heart and Vascular Center at Semmelweis University from where he's coming to us. And I wanted to quickly share his, uh, uh, on the screen of his uh, attributes, if you can just see here, his awards. So almost, I think he has taken all the Young Investigator Award finalist positions in Europe and US, uh, at least in ultrasound. And also I wanted to point out uh, uh, his uh, programming skills. So he's one of those unique person who is uh, not just a, a medicine a researcher, but also actually is at the cusp of becoming, is an engineer. So, uh, and, and I know him very well because he worked with me uh, at West Virginia University where he developed some of those breakthrough models uh, in diastolic dysfunction. And today he's going to share with us how he has applied that on a very interesting disease. Uh, more to Martin uh, for taking us through the suspense that you have already created. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, and I truly appreciate this opportunity to present our work, which will be also presented at the upcoming ACC meeting as a flatboard poster. So in this study, we investigated the potential role of deep learning uh, in predicting the progression of aortic valve sclerosis to aortic stenosis. Aortic valve sclerosis, the calcification and thickening of the aortic valve without significant obstruction of flow, um, is a common finding and its prevalence increases with age. Approximately 25% of individuals at the age of 65 have aortic valve sclerosis, increasing to 50% of age uh, at the age of 80. And although some clinicians still regard it as an innocent murmur, there is strong evidence that aortic sclerosis is associated with adverse outcomes, such as coronary events, uh, cardiovascular, as well as all-cause mortality. 
Uh, although almost 2% of uh, subjects with aortic sclerosis progress to clinical aortic stenosis each year, uh, it is still challenging to identify these patients. Uh, recently, several machine learning uh, and deep learning studies have been published focusing on diagnosing and grading aortic stenosis, predicting outcomes in these patients, and optimizing uh, the follow-up uh, and assessing the progression of the disease. Uh, nevertheless, the progression of aortic valve sclerosis to aortic stenosis has remained a relatively unexplored area. Accordingly, we hypothesized that a deep learning model could identify the light lat latent risk associated with the progression of aortic valve sclerosis to aortic stenosis. Uh, in this study, we analyzed the data collected in the ERIC study, a prospective epidemiologic cohort uh, study started in uh, 1987, investigating the etiology of atherosclerosis and its clinical sequelae. This study initially enrolled almost uh, 16,000 participants from four U.S. communities. Uh, from these participants, we analyzed those who underwent an echocardiographic examination during uh, the fifth visit between uh, 2011 and 2013, and whose data was available in the BioLink database. After excluding patients with conditions that might bias our analysis and with missing values in the key echocardiographic variables, we identified uh, 905 patients showing aortic valve sclerosis defined as an aortic valve uh, peak velocity between uh, 1.5 and 2.5 meters per second. Uh, outcomes of int interest were the new diagnosis of aortic stenosis and the composite of aortic valve intervention um, and the cardiovascular deaths uh, subsequent to newly diagnosed aortic stenosis. Uh, over the median of 5.5 years, 11% uh, of the patients developed aortic stenosis, whereas 2% uh, of the patients reached the composite endpoint. Uh, we used our previously published and thoroughly validated deep learning model that assesses left ventricular uh, diastolic dysfunction based on nine routinely measured echocardiographic parameters. These parameters are left ventricular mass index, ejection fraction, EA, uh, e over A, septal E prime, E over E prime, left atrial volume index, and uh, tricuspid regurgitation peak velocity. To develop the deep learning model, first we perform topological data analysis uh, to integrate these echocardiographic variables into a similarity network, uh, in which patients uh, with varying degrees of uh, systolic and diastolic uh, dysfunction uh, are presented as a continuous loop, as shown in this figure. After labeling these patients as high uh, and uh, low risk, depending on the location on this loop, we trained a deep uh, neural network for predicting the high and low risk groups. Finally, the model was externally validated in multiple cohorts, showing that its predictions are associated with higher rates of heart failure, hospitalizations, cardiac death, uh, elevated left ventricular feeling pressure, uh, and neural hormonal activation and lower exercise capacity. Uh, let's move on to our results. Uh, when we compare the clinical and echocardiographic characteristics of patients who developed aortic stenosis during the follow-up with those who did not, we could observe a higher prevalence of cardiovascular risk factors and the accumulation of abnormalities in both uh, functional and structural echocardiographic parameters. Uh, higher aortic valve uh, peak velocities and, and mean gradients were also noted among those who were diagnosed with aortic stenosis during follow-up. Uh, our deep learning model uh, predicted higher probabilities and classified more patients uh, to the higher risk group from those who reached the endpoint. When we plotted the event-free event -free survival of participants, a higher proportion of high-risk than low-risk uh, patients received the diagnosis of aortic stenosis and reached the composite endpoint during the follow-up. Moreover, we also demonstrated using univariable Cox regression and that the deep learning predictive probability is a predictor of both outcomes of interest. Uh, using multivariable Cox regression models, including clinical variables and uh, aortic valve peak velocity, we also confirm 
uh, that the deep learning uh, predictive probability is an independent predictor of the new diagnosis of aortic stenosis. Uh, although we could uh, only include the aortic valve velocity as a covariate in a multivariable model due to low number of participants reaching the composite endpoint, the deep learning predictive probability was still found to be an independent predictor of uh, this endpoint as well. Furthermore, uh, in predicting the new diagnosis of aortic stenosis, the deep learning derived LNA probability uh, showed incremental value over clinical variables. Um, and the uh, aortic valve peak velocity with, with improvement in C statistics, uh, network classification, and integrated discrimination. In predicting the composite endpoint, uh, deep learning derived uh, uh, probability showed an incremental value over aortic uh, valve peak velocity. So based on our finding, we may conclude that deep learning techniques can integrate echocardiographic parameters to predict the latent risk associated with the progression of aortic valve sclerosis to aortic stenosis. Moreover, deep learning has the potential to optimize and personalize the follow-up of these patients uh, with aortic valve sclerosis. Although our results are promising, there are still room for improvement. Uh, in future studies, we plan to upgrade our model by incorporating additional clinical variables or using data from other domains, uh, such as omics data, which will likely improve uh, the prediction performance. Uh, our current model was trained to analyze only a snapshot of the disease course instead of exploiting longitudinal data, such as data from multiple echocardiographic examinations of the same patient, even though uh, the recorded root of the disease is highly predictive for future uh, clinical outcomes. Thus, the individualized modeling of disease trajectories uh, and developing time-aware models for forecasting a progression would have high clinical relevance. Last but not least, uh, future studies uh, should also assess how integrating our model into clinical practice would, would improve patient care and outcomes. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Martin, for uh, an important study that uh, is trying to identify which subset of patients who have aortic sclerosis will develop aortic stenosis in the future. I think this is going to be a million dollar question for all the uh, future uh, clinical trials and clinical studies which are looking at um, therapeutic interventions. And also, there are, uh, believe it or not, uh, there are clinical trials starting in Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital here on what is called as decalcification therapy. So we are soon going to be starting a clinical trial where we are trying to, if you see an early markers of calcium on the aortic valve, then we're going to start a decalcification therapy so that the progression could be halted. So these are uh, important um, areas of continued research. So uh, I'm going to open it up for uh, question and answers in the interest of time. Are, are you planning in the, um, to include as a future variable whether the patient is taking statins? Uh, yes, that's an excellent idea. So uh, the current model only includes the nine echocardiographic variables, but it's uh, but we can also combine the predicted probability or go back and try to upgrade our model with uh, additional input variables. This could be even any clinical variables uh, for, uh, starting from demographics or like symptoms, also uh, medications uh, and other like, risk factors, like anything else in the medical history. So we, we anticipate that this would uh, certainly improve our prediction performance. So maybe, Martin, what you could do to address an important question that was raised uh, in the 900 cases, uh, you could go back and see how many patients had statins. And if they were on statins, do you see any difference uh, in the progression of uh, aortic stenosis? Maybe that, that is a subset analysis that you could do. Mm. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. And uh, also I didn't show that we have uh, several uh, lab, uh, lab data. I mean, so we can also uh, try to find other associations between like cholesterol level. I think that would be also an interesting direction that we can investigate. Any other questions?
All right, so I think uh, we are just about time. Uh, thank you very much to all the three participants. This was excellent. I think besides this, uh, I want to also highlight uh, there will be so many more other presentations, uh, case reports, podium presentation. I will have a presentation of a late-breaking clinical trial. So uh, I think there will be a substantial uh, presence from um, uh, New Brunswick. And also the health system has got a uh, booth in the exhibit area. We'll also try to find some time for us to come together during the ACC. So if you're visiting uh, ACC, uh, then please leave, uh, let us know uh, because we will uh, send out uh, an email shortly uh, so that we can have a time, uh, we can all uh, be there together and cheer everyone who are participating. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, so long live the spirit of uh, research and, uh, and education and look forward to uh, continuing this journey for the next several years. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you.